Good evening, everyone. Happy Poetry Month. Happy Wednesday. I'm Bernard Schwartz, the director of the 92nd Street Y Zuntberg Poetry Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's readings by Valjina Mort and Yusuf Komenyaka. They will be uh, introduced by poet and editor Lauren McClung. And after the readings, uh, Lauren will come back to interview them for about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, given that it is uh, National Poetry Month, um, I wanted to alert you to a couple upcoming classes. Uh, these include a uh, two-session seminar by Paisley Rectal on uh, war poetry as well as um, a upcoming class on Schubert's Leader uh, with Thomas Hampson. Uh, in the Maiden Reading series, uh, we have uh, two other April events. April 27th, uh, Jhumpa Lahiri will read uh, from her new work and uh, discuss it with Howard Norman. And on April 29th, uh, for the first time in uh, more than a year, we will be back in our concert hall presenting a uh, reading by Andre Holland of Saidia Hartman's dramatic monologue, uh, The End of White Supremacy and American Romance, uh, which was originally published last summer in Bomb Magazine and is a retelling of W.E.B. Du Bois's story, The Comet. Uh, for more information on the classes and the virtual events, as well as uh, possibly attending the uh, in-person event featuring Andre, um, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. Um, and uh, that's really it for me. The poets will read for each about 15 minutes, and then, as I say, they'll have a conversation with Lauren, and. Uh, We'll get you home in about an hour. Um, thank you for tuning in, and please welcome Warren McClung. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here tonight among friends in our community at this time. Um, thank you to the 92nd Street Y for hosting this event and to Bernard Schwartz for curating the series for all these years, and especially for curating this incredible pairing of poets tonight. Um, I'm going to begin just by introducing uh, Yusef Komenyaka, and then I will introduce Valjina Mort, who will begin reading for you. Okay. So Yusef Komenyaka's books of poetry include Dinke Dao, Neon Vernacular, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize, Pleasure Dome, Talking Dirty to the Gods, War Horses, Emperor of Water Clocks, and his new and selected Everyday Mojo Songs of Earth, forthcoming from FSG this June. His honors include the William Faulkner Prize, uh, University Grand France, the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, and the 2011 Wallace Stevens Award, among many others in a long career of over four decades. His plays, performance art, and lib libretti have been performed internationally and include Saturnalia, Wakanda's Dream, Testimony, and Gilgamesh. Um, he retired from teaching at New York University this year. Okay. Valjina Mort is a poet and translator born in Belarus. She is author of three poetry collections, Factory of Tears and Collected Body, a Factory of Tears 2008, Collected Body as 2011, both from Copper Canyon, and most recently, Music for the Dead and Resurrected from FSG. Her work has been honored with many awards, including a Lannan Foundation Fellowship, and the Amy Clampett Fellowship. And tonight it is a great honor to announce that Music for the Dead and Resurrected has been shortlisted for the uh, 2021 International Griffin Poetry Award. Mort translates between English, Belarusian, Russian, Ukrainian, and Polish. She has received the Gulf Coast Poetry 
Prize in Translation and the National Endowment for the Arts Grant in Translation for her work on Polina Washkova's book of selected poems, Air Raid from Ugly Duckling. She is editor of Something Indecent, Poems Recommended by Eastern European Poets. Um, and with Ilya Kaminsky and Katie Ferris, um, she co-edited co Gossip and Metaphysics, Russian Modernist Poems and Prose. Her collections have been published in, in translation in Germany, Sweden, and the UK. Please welcome Valjina Mort. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it's a great pleasure to read with Yusuf Komunyaka, whose music is so important to me. As I take you now to the streets of Minsk, uh, you will hear that it's not just me leading you through them, but uh, Yusuf's music is there too. My book came out in November. Uh, so I've never had an in-person reading, only virtual readings. And just as I thought that nothing could be worse than a Zoom laptop reading, something went wrong with my internet and I'm on the cell phone doing a cell phone reading. So things can be worse than Zoom readings on laptops. Uh, well, um, thank you for tuning in and I'll just jump right into reading um, from uh, this chair onto a public bus in Minsk. Bus stops, Ars Poetica. Not books, but a street open my mouth like a doctor's spatula. One by one, streets introduce themselves with the names of national murderers. In the state archives, covers hardened like scabs over the ledgers. Inside a tiny apartment, I built myself into a separate room. Peopled it with the calibans of plans for the future. Future that runs on the schedule of public buses. From the zoo to the circus, what future? What is your alibi for these ledgers, these streets, this apartment? Future in the purse that held through seven wars the birth certificates of the dead. My grandmother hid from me chocolates. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. Its two shiny buckles watched me through doors, through walls, through jazz. Who has taught you to be a frightening face? purse. I kiss your buckles. I swear myself your subject. August. Apples. I have no body. August. For me, a ripe apple is a brother. For me, a four-legged table is a pet. In the temple of supermarket, I stand like a candle in the line to the priestesses who preserve the knowledge of sausage prices, the virginity of milk cartons, my future small change. Future that runs on the schedule of public buses, streets introduce themselves with the names of national murderers. I built myself into a separate room where memory, the illegal migrant in time, cleans up after imagination. In a room where memory strips the beds, linens that hardened like scabs on the mattresses, I kiss little apples, my brothers. I kiss the buckles that watch us through walls, through years, through jazz, chocolates from a purse that held through seven wars, the birth certificates of the dead. Hold me. Brother Apple. They say that a poem is a message in a bottle. Um, a poetry reading is certainly not. And I really miss you all as you are there. I hope you could see and hear me. 
Uh, I hope that I'm not a message in the bottle in this video, but um, there are real people somewhere there watching. Um, now that we are in Minsk, I'll read two dedications, two addresses. One of them is an address in Brotherhood. It's uh, addressed to a Belarusian poet, Maxim Bogdanovich, who died very young of tuberculosis in 1917, just 20 years before most of his colleagues and could-be colleagues would be executed on Stalin's orders. Come in, Maxim. This is Minsk, choked under a pillow of clouds. Here you are, a statue in a heavy coat. Here all monuments wear coats, not wool, but linden bark coats with bee fur collars. In their pockets, monuments keep belts, and under collars, monuments have necks. In winter, shadows insulate the walls, windows and cracks are plucked with shadows. In museums, coats and nooses are on display, and water is pickle juice. Come in, Maxim. Apartment blocks are wrapped in ammunition staircases, and window medals sparkle through the night. Every building here is a kind of bust, and elevator sounds like vomit. For furniture, there is a stump. Come in, Maxim. Come flying. Sit on a stump, don't cast a shadow, keep your coat on, and please, come flying, a comet statue flying, a comet medal to Minsk. And the second address is an address for sisterhood. It's an address to Antigone. The fact that she is from Sepoclis's place, perhaps secondary, what matters to me most about Antigone is that she's somebody who, like in fairy tales, uh, is forbidden to do a thing very strictly so, and yet she goes and does it. To Antigone, a dispatch. An epigraph is a musical one. Allegro for shooing off the police. Adagio for washing the body. Scherzo for soft laughter and tears, Rondo for covering the body with good earth. Antigone, dead siblings are set. As for the living, pick me for a sister. I too love a proper funeral. Drag digging sisters, pop up, burial. Landlady, I make the rounds of graves, keeping up my family's top notch properties. On a torture instrument called an accordion, I stretch my bones into fingers of a witch. My guts have been emptied like bellows for the best sound. Once we settle your brother, I'll show you forests of Van Burry dead. We'll clean the way only two sisters can clean a house. No bones scattered like dirty socks, no ashes at the bottom of kneecaps. Why bicker with husbands about dishes when we've got mountains of skulls to shine? Labor and retribution will share, not girly secrets. Brought up by dolls and monuments, I have the bearings of a horse and a bitch. I'm cement in tears. You can spot my graves from afar, marble like newborn skin. Here, History comes to an end, like a movie, with rolling credits of headstones, with nameless credits of mass graves. Every ditch, every hill is suspect. Pick me for a sister, Antigone. In this suspicious land, I have a bright shovel of a face. Put your bones into braids of graves' woods. Put your bones into great braids of graves' ravines. Put your bones into braids of graves, fields. Put your bones into braids of graves, swamps. Put your graves into braids of bones, mother. Put your graves into braids of bones, moth. Put your graves into braids of bones, ghost. 
Put your craves into braids of bones, yes. Braid your bones neatly, braid your bones bravely. Finger comb your bones into neat braids in our woods, ravines, fields, swamps. And I'll read two more poems. Uh, it's very hard to have a sense of any time um, sitting here alone in my work office, uh, looking into the phone. Uh, to change the mood just a bit, I'll read a poem called Poets Biography. Um, and I would like to dedicate it right now to Adam Zagajewski, um, who passed away uh, this month, and even though um, the poet mentioned in this book is obviously not Adam, he also loved trains, um, and um, his books are certainly in my frostbitten hands in this past weeks. Poet's Biography. I picked your book from Sandeep's shelf. The poet's biography read, leave and teaches. Though the book was fairly recent, it was no longer true. I almost met you once, and almost meeting I remember clearly because of my embarrassment. I was having loud sex in a hotel room while you stood knocking at the door wanting to give me your book. Now the trains stand frozen in a winter storm. And I pity the trains as if they were shivering butterflies, a whole herd of them, the last one of its kind, stuck in the snow England has never seen. Sandeep is cooking dinner, you are dead, the lover's gone, your book in my frostbitten hands. And the last poem I will read is called uh, Gamma Rays. And uh, it is a poem that brings together Chernobyl and uh, music. Uh, it starts a bit like a dictionary. I'll try to show it with my voice, but then uh, it doesn't manage to stay a dictionary. It gets rather jazzy. <laughs> Uh, because my grandma comes in, uh, my grandmother copied uh, my uh, music notes into the music notebooks. And if you ever copied music, you know that it's very important. Or if you ever played uh, according to a music score, you know that it's very important to place the notes exactly between the lines or on the lines. But my grandmother was musically literate and half blind. So all of these notes were misplaced. That's where the jazz comes in. Gamma rays. Cupid's arrow, a Caesar's beak I stuck into my thighs, 30 kilometers from Minsk, sunstruck. The sun, Chernobyl radio station. Broadcasts its radiation is always on. The sun speaks into the tulips, microphones. Microphones. Victor sits by the cow's udder, like in a recording studio. Record. Janina, blind, copies sheet music from my teacher's songbook, Beethoven, deaf, for accordion into my notebook. Xerox, unavailable in the empire, prized like a spaceship. Musical staff, according to the music teacher, not Yanina's kitchen shelves, unacceptable to reshelf at liberty to adjust music pitch like spices. Music teacher, a beautiful woman, furious like Beethoven's hair. Musical staff, according to Yanina. Rows of plank beds in the northern barracks. 
Notes are the bodies, rounded and flattened by day's labor, either utterly dark or insanely empty inside. This is what makes music so poignant, so painful. Notes, also, according to Janina, ladles. Beethoven, music should strike fire from the heart of man and bring tears from the eyes of woman. Janina to Beethoven. So, music is a family brawl? Notes, according to the music teacher, ladles full of water Janina dumps onto Beethoven's fire. My heart on fire with fury every time the music teacher slams Janina's blind coping. I despise and secretly envy Beethoven for having nothing to do with plank beds in the northern barracks. A daily source of Beethoven, Chernobyl radio station, the joy of radioactive rains. My mission, I combat gamma rays with music octaves. Janina tucks notes into plank beds of music stuff. On one of them, she recognizes her old husband. Her blindness blurs all features into the ovals of notes. The cow chews reed grass, but there is no cow. Birds shred the clouds with their dull beaks. The woods are thin like soup. Men live only on photographs, alone, Old women are old women. They lock in dentures. They log glasses onto hooked noses. They hook themselves into fork lifting bras. Secure kerchiefs with sailors' knots and thus protected more thoroughly than first responders. They curse their hands and pigs as if they had hands and pigs. A rooster's call quick like a vaccine shot. The scissor's beak is as far as a cupid's arrow gets here. I fall in love with music she miscopies, music she syncopates, miscaring and miscoping without a peep. Thank you. Thank you. It is great to um, hear Valjana read. I think the last time I read with her was actually 2017 in Florence. So here we go. A world of daughters. She look clean at birth, say, weeping in the tall grass where this tantalizing song begins. Birds pause on a crooked branch over a grave of a, an unending track into the valley of cooling waters. Lessons of earth, old questions more and more, the first tongue say, I have gone back, says the oracle, counting seasons and centuries, undoing fault lines between one generation and next, as she twirls sackcloth, edge with pollen, and one glimpses what one did not know, say, this is where the goat was asked to speak legends ago, to kneel and deliver a sacrifice, to feel a truth depends on how and why the singer's song fits into the mouth. Well, I believe the Barrett Rib story is the other way round.
in, entangled in decree and blessing, law, and biff, one only has to listen to night long pleas of a mother who used all thousand chants and prayers of clay, red oracle, blown from the mouth upon the high stone wall, retracing a foundal land bridge to wishbound. My own two daughters and granddaughter, the three know how to work praise and lament, ready to sprout wings of naked flight and labor. Yes, hange into earth, we rose from Lucy to clan, from clan to tribe, and today we worship her sun polished bones, remembering she is made of questions. No, Mama is not always the first word before counting eggs in the cowbird's nest. He begins in memory. Now, say her name. Say Dankmesh, mother of us all. Okay, the next poem is titled Slingshot. A boy's bicycle inner tube, red as inside the body. A well chosen forked limb sold from a scrub oak. And then an hour long squint to get it right. The top pull is everything. There's nothing without resistance. And the day holds. The hard, slow, steady, horning flips a beetle on its back, but the boy refuses to squash it. He continues with his work. Summer rammers into a quiet quadrant of dogwood and gum. A girl he's too shy to tell his name stands in damp light, nearing dark. And biting a corner of his lip, he whittles the true stop, knowing wrong from right. Throw Pythagoras on a simple truth. The boy untangles a triangle of pull within a triangle of release. The sling shots tongue a tongue torn out of an old army boot and lord what a perfect fit feet spread apart the boy straddles an imaginary line settling quietly into himself as the banners and pull travel down through his fingers, forearm, elbow, into muscle, up through his shoulder blades, neck, mouth, set of the jaw, into the register of the brain, sand, take a breath and exhale slowly. Then let the stone fly as if it has swallowed a stone. And that is when the boy knows his body is a compass 
across. I, I love to go between emotional and psychological terrains. Um, so this next poem is titled, The Body Remembers. I stood on one foot for three minutes and didn't tilt the scales. Do you remember how quickly we scrambled up an oak leaning out over the creek? How easy to trust the water to break of a glorious leaps. The body remembers every wish one lives for or doesn't, or even horror of a dance was a rally in sunny leaves, then quick as anything, Johnny Dixon was up, opening his wide arms in the tallest oak, waving to the sky in the flick of an eye. He was a buffalo fish gig, pleading for help, voiced voiceless. Bigger and stronger, he knew every turn in the creek past his back door. But now he was cooing like a brown dove in a trap of twigs. A water hung spear of kindling jotted up as if it were the point of our folly and humbug on a Sunday afternoon, right? Five of us carried him home through the thicket. Our feet cutting a new path, running in sleep years later. We were young as condom balloons, flowering crab apple trees and double bloom, and had a world of baffled hope and breath. Does Johnny run fingers over the thick web? His belly, days we were still invincible. Sometimes I spend half a day feeling for bones, honing, humming a half forgotten ballad on a pork bench a long ways from home. The body remembers the berry bushes, heavy with sweetness, shivering in a lonely woods. But I doubt if it knows words live longer than clay and spit of flesh as rock bottom love. Is it easier to remember pleasure or does hurt ease to his hunger? Ava Summer rocking back and forth, uprooting what's to come, the shadow of the tree weighed as much as a man. Okay, just uh, two last poems. Poppies. These frantic blooms can hold their own when it comes to metaphor and God. 
Take any name or shade of irony, my any flowery indifference or stolen gratitude, and have a eyes, good or bad, still run up to the hue. Take this woman sitting beside me, a descendant of Hungarian gypsies born to teach horses to dance and eat sugar from her hand. Does she know beauty? Couldn't have protected her that a poppy tuck in her hair couldn't have saved her from those German storm troopers. This frightens me. I see eyes peeping through narrow slacks of callow cars. Heron twice forever. I see Jude and Star of David strivel across a depot. But she says, that's the name of a soccer team, baby. Red clams the hills and descends. Heron out of out to the edge of a perfect view, and then another between white and violet. Is it a skirt or cape flung to the ground? Is it all day now worked into the soil? Is it a hungry new vanity that rises and then runs up to have a bleeding train. I am a black man, a poet, a bohemian, and there isn't a road my mind doesn't travel. I also have my cheap one-way ticket to Auschwitz and know of no street or footpath death hasn't taken. The poppies rush ahead up to a cardinal singing on Bob War. And the last poem is Ode to the Oud. Gourd-shaped muse, swollen with wind in the mulberry. Tell me everything you are made of, little desert boat of Ra. Oblong box of bedden doves pecking pomegranate seeds out of the air. You are the poet's persona, his dabba, and the high priestess, third chamber, each string a litany of stars over the Sahara, pear-shaped traveler, strong but so light, is there a wishbone holding you together? I wish I knew how to open you up with an eagle's feather or a pick whittle from buffalo horn singing alive the dust of Nubia, rosewood season long ago. I wish I could close your 12 mouths with kisses, tongues strung in a row. I wish I could open every sound in you. I envy one blessed to master himself by rocking you in his lonely arms, little ship of sorrow, bend your voice 
till the names of heroes and courtesans, birds and animals, prayers and love songs swum from your belly. Thank you. Here we are. <laughs> yes, here we are. <laughs> virtual room together. Um, thank you for your readings. Um, I think I want to start, I guess, with, uh, with questions about the titles that come from the titles of your work. So, so Valjina, I, I want to start with you and um, your, your, your new collection, Music for the Dead and Resurrected. Um, why make music for the dead? And if poems are a way of resurrecting, what is that for? I apologize for my connection. There's a little, I think, delay and uh, um, extra sounds. I hope that you could hear me well. Um, uh, why, um, why music? Uh, well, you know, um, just uh, just before, just today, um, I saw a picture online of um, Alfred Schnitke's gravestone, and it shows uh, musical um, musical lines, and um, and then there is a fermata which means indefinite pause <laughs> for as long as you need. And um, a little mark that means rest. It means that the musicians are resting. Mm -hmm. And underneath, there is a fortissimo, the loud rest, loud silence. And um, uh, music for me also shapes, gives a shape to my life. Um, I grew up in a strange place, beautiful and violent, uh, at the same time uh, in a, a totalitarian empire, um, uh, and uh, went to school, and uh, at lunch my grandmother would sit me at the table and tell me the stories of her life. She loved to talk about hunger when I ate, for example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but then the radio was always on. And the radio played music. It played Schnitke, it played Rachmaninoff, it played Scriabin. And so mu music was always the background to all of these stories and to all of this life. Um, and it was, now when I think of it, it's always music in sunshine. It's always illuminating um, something. And it was always a reminder uh, that uh, between all of these violence and poverty and stories of survival, there is music, uh, radiant. Um, and it's something that um, is a space of coping, I think. And how else can one talk to the dead? Not certainly in a human language, certainly not in the language one talk, speaks to the living. Um, that's what music is for. Yeah, it's uh, the perfect perfect speech that goes across time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, there's this, this um, way that music is something before it's translated into sound almost, you know, this, um, this idea, this feeling that's conjured that when we then deliver the notes, it makes so in that space between, um, between what we imagine and what we conjure that way and what's delivered in sounds, it feels like, like poetry feels at the heart of that. And like there's that space between two worlds that we're accessing somehow. Yeah, yeah. Of, uh, you know when of songs, uh, my title, Everyday Mojo Songs of Earth, uh, automatically Mojo Songs, those are songs are, that's a kind of conjuring is also um, a kind of lucky charm when I think about mojos. Uh, but um, 
it really links to blues. And um, I grew up with radio as well. Uh, matter of fact, especially when I was around four, I would actually hug the radio uh, just to feel the music coming almost into one's body. Yeah. So it has a lot to do with what we internalize. And I think that's what poetry is about as well, that we internalize, not sensations, but more or less gut liver feelings. Um, and we are not fully conscious of those things often, but the magic is taking place because the brain is such an incredible levering device. We think about um, singing the poem. It's almost one wants to sing the poem. So mm -hmm. music is always part. It, language is our first music. And the body, I always say, is amplified. So it's felt. It's lived. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I think uh, I want to. I want to move on to talk a little bit about. I, I guess I'll start with Volgina. In your in your poems, objects are animated and surreal and alive, and your. Uh, talking to them and they are engaging with you and it's so vivid. Um, but there's also there's also something happening in some of your poems with the land. The land has been brutalized and it's holding a secret. Mm. Um, I'm thinking of your poem, Nocturne for a Moving Train. And you write, and I quote here, the trees I've glimpsed from the window of a night train were the saddest trees. He seemed about to speak then vanished like soldiers. In the same poem, you also use the phrases radiation and etymology of the soil, the shocking betrayal of apples, the apple coming back again, and the uncompromised loyalty of Cynthian. And the repeating phrase, I was extracted. Um, uh, before that last line, the chestnuts are about to speak, you say. Right. I hear the landscape is holding a secret it wants to tell us. That. Can you talk about the secrets of landscapes for, as a poet? I mean, we're not talking about the delicate, you know, uh, color of the cherry blossoms here. I mean, when you're talking about the landscape, there's a gravity to this. Can you talk about that? Oh, thank you so much. Um, I think that your question already contains such a beautiful reading of my work. I'm very grateful for making those connections. Um, it's true, things are very important to me and landscape as part of those things, uh, perhaps because historically I come from a place where there's a lot of censorship um, and uh, um, uh, there is a lot of monopoly on stories. And um, also it's a place where a lot of people have not survived. And so I al always, since early on, had a feeling that inanimate objects and landscape too, are, are imbue imbued with witness. They're in imbued with testimony. They see us and more so they're so burdened by having to watch what we humans do to each other. Mm. And so um, so there is a radio, for example, Yusuf, I'm glad we have that connection. We had a radio that was like a family member, you know, <laughs> this thing made of plastic. <laughs> Yet for me, I remember it as a family member. And um, that, that's why I read a poem about a purse that is screaming. Yeah. Yeah, it's full of it's full of stories and um, trees too, trees, grass. You know, in Svetlana Alexievich's book, uh, uh, Wars and Womanly Face, there's one testimony. Um, well, there are many testimonies, but a wo one woman speaks about arriving to the site 
of a village where everybody has been executed mm. and there are just corpses corpses around and amid these corpses horses stand mm. Mm. and and she says that she pitied most the horses that how could somebody do something so horrific in fr in mm. front of such beautiful animals why did they have to see all of this and um, and i have this feeling all the time I'm back home why does the grass have to see all this why do the trees have to see all this but in those there's also of course chernobyl disaster had um, um it was an ecological and it remains the ecological catastrophe and so landscape is imbued with radiation when I was a child, I was four years old when the explosion happened, and we heard that there are monsters, animals turned monsters, humans turned monsters, and they're somewhere, somewhere in our country, you know, and fairy tales became real, yeah? Landscape is history, objects are history, but also a fairy tale. Mm. Yeah. 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 I feel like that's converging for me too with your poem, you said that you were reading poppies tonight and the, um, you know, the way that this, this sight of the poppies uh, transports you into history as well, you know. Um, yeah, do you want to say anything? Um, I was just really taken with the beauty of the poppies mm -hmm. and realized that it was all, I saw the poppies and I kept glancing out the, um, out the train. But before I knew it, we were there facing, you know, facing Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. It was almost as I've been led there by this kind of beauty and there I'm facing what was an instrument of terror for so many people. And, and yeah, and realizing that, yes, I, in a, in a different time, in circumstance, I probably would have been there as well, you know, experiencing that terror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess that makes me want to move forward to the time we live in right now, um, which has just been his, you know, coming to a crescendo over the last, you know, year plus between this global pandemic and the, um, the, there's global violence happening and national violence here um, that, that we've really been uh, trying to return return from. It just seems like it's, you know, how do we get beyond this is, is what we ask ourselves. And um, in, in this time we're living in, I think I, I want to ask, what is poetry for? Uh, you know, how does, a poet, how does a poem or a poet respond to these kinds of realities, especially, you know, when they're happening, you know, as opposed to maybe as we're writing about our past, the aftermath of these things, how do we, how are we responding to now? Well, I feel that the, the poem isn't really, uh, about answers as much as questions. And I think that's what happens, is that we internalize the, the music of the telling, of the sin, and we have questions. We go away with questions, and they are not really questions that's on the surface the questions that we wake up in the middle of the night and the questions have been doing their work. And we try to come to some kind of new place 
within our conscience. Yeah, I guess I think immediately of your poem, Rock Me Mercy, you know, which is written some time ago now, but um, yeah, with this, this gun violence um, that had happened in Newtown, you know, and these, uh, yeah, I can't even say it, it's so sad. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and here you've written this very short poem that, that um, is able to confront it, to grieve somehow. Um, yeah, maybe sometimes this is part of what we do as poets too. Uh, well, Gina, do you want to say anything that you're thinking? Uh, yeah, it is, has been an incredibly difficult year and I have to confess um, a vain that I started it very vainly with a lot of bravado saying yeah. well you know I will stand my when my country collapsed <laughs> I will in, yeah. live through worse but uh, it's been an extremely difficult year of um, such great violence in this country and in my home country where uh, the the medical crisis, the health crisis is a second thought because yeah. people are too busy uh, fighting uh, for the most basic rights. Um, and uh, yeah, the right for health is not even that, <laughs> as it turns out, mm -hmm. the right to be safe from COVID becomes secondary. But I think yeah. that we also, I see um, that there is this whole emergence of these new forms. In Belarus, we now say that um, there is new literary genre and it's called mm -hmm. the last word in court, the last word at your trial. And people listen to it and the way that they would do to a poem. But in this mm -hmm. country, I was thinking, of course, great failure of language too, words of apology, condolences. Right. It's failure of language. And then we respond to it with our, with our rage, with our, uh, you know, heartbreak. And it's also a failure of language. Right. And, uh, but I think I so agree with Yusuf that at the same time, uh, a poem is not an illustration right. of what is going on. It's a search. It's a search for um, a kind of language. But what we see is how imperfect this most reliable tool is mm. we yeah. think that this is oh this is just handy this is just handy we're going to stand in front of microphone and apologize and express concern and say mm. that we're sorry or say that mm. we're hurting mm. and but then this instrument is a total failure <laughs> yeah it just it can never live up to this crisis I yeah. hope, but then Yusuf read and he said, mother of all of us in the, right? Yes. Was the okay. at the end of the poem? And I thought, I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to hum it like a soundtrack. Mother yeah. of all of us. Oh, it's oh, going to oh. hold. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Well, I feel like that is a beautiful place to, to bring our conversation to a close tonight. Um, it's fun time, so. Um, thank you both very much for your readings and then uh, conversation here. And thanks to the 92nd Street Y. Um, and on behalf of the 92nd Street Y, thanks to all of the listeners who have tuned in today. So, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.